God. Hello. Oh, so we're going to do a postmortem on this little calf. Um, so this producer, good fellow from up near Varley, she's lost, she's lost four out of a hundred. How many, um, how many of calves so far, Owen? Uh, that'd be 30, 30, 37. Okay, so we've got 10% losses, which is a bummer. Jeez, these are like condoms, they're pretty damn tight, eh? <laughs> um, got to wear these to kind of, uh, um, sometimes I wear them, sometimes I don't. Um, so what we're going to do is postmortem. Whenever you do a postmortem on a ruminant, it's best to do them with the right side up because otherwise the, the rumen lies in the way and you, and you can't see what's going on behind it. So uh, what I do, um, I've got, got my friend Ruben here who's uh, been with us for three or four years now. Yep. And he's a Jedi. We're just going to show him some of the stuff that I do when I do a postmortem. So good sharp knife. Um, on a big cow, roots, just because we don't get to go out and do a lot of stuff together. On a big cow, I'll use my leg to hold to that leg back and then I come back and risk it. I just run out of the skin. Up to the throat patch. But if you run out of the skin, you don't dull your knife, folks. Then I take my leg and hold the leg forward like that, and I come back to the spot where I cut through the brisket before, and I just continue that incision back into the back into the axilla. Like that. It's kind of even though it's, he's a little guy, and it'd be pretty easy to do it a lot quicker if we went through. And then often I'll get the farmer to hold that leg up. If there's no farmer, I'll put that over my shoulder. And then I just cut back down into the corner here. And cut down to the hip joint. Now when you get to the hip joint, you can look here if they got joint ill. Yeah. I'll cut into the individual joints. But um, but I always just check that joint first to make sure that the snow is good for you. So this guy died yesterday. Uh, Owen lives about what three hours from us? Yep. Um, we're the closest vet and um, and he's been in the cool room, so things are going to be a little bit kind of digested. And then I'll get the farmer to hang on to that leg for me. On, on a big beast, on a little cat like this, not a big deal. And then I'll just trim away the hide over the top. I normally have a cat, you just go ahead and cut through the skin. Right? And then that, that shoulder blade will just fall back. And we open the abdomen up. Now, a cool thing on a feedlot steer that's pretty rad is if they die of bloat, they'll be hemorrhagic from here forward because as the, as, the, as the abdomen fills up with gas from a bloat, it'll press on the diaphragm and blood can't get back into the chest. And also, blood can't get to the back of the body, so they'll be bloody from here and pale back. So it's a really handy thing in a feedlot to work out if an animal died of bloated after death or bloated before death. Um, on a big critter, coming over here, y'all. Um, to get into the abdomen, I'll come in right behind the ribs and I'll cut through until I've got a spot and then I'll turn my knife around. Again, this is a little calf, so it's a little bit overkill. But I bring my knife like this so I can open up the abdomen without cutting into the, into the guts. If you cut into the guts, that's a cart. So I don't make enough money as a vet to pay for all these cartons. So that lays everything out. And then I'll have a quick look at what's going on abdominally, which we're gonna, but, but I won't go in there yet because if you go in here, the whole, the whole procedure turns to shit as far as meat carts go. So you just can't cover everything in poop. But I'll just have a quick gander after I've gone in here, just looking for anything obvious and abnormal. But I won't go diving in there. Then I'll go into the chest. So on a big steer, on a, on a cow, you kind of need to use like a, either a reciprocating saw like, like uh, Ruben does, or a set of nippers, or an ax to cut the ribs so you can bring it back. But on a young steer up to about two years of age, because they're still growing, this is all cartilage through here. So what you can do is just grab a Find a spot between the ribs, cut down. And again, on a cat, this would be really easy to do. But on a, just to show you the technique, come down to the costa chondral junction, costa, ribs, chondral, down here. Turn your knife on a 90 degree angle, and then you get a good solid hold on your leg. Keep your leg out of the way, because you don't want to spear yourself. And then you just cut down along those costa chondral junctions, just like that. Then on a big steer, like on a cap, I can just break all these back. But on a, on a big steer, what I would do, is cut, cut individual ribs, maybe, maybe in groups of two, and I'll just break them back. So if we're talking about a big feedlot here, just give me the visualization of what I do. Break, break these ribs back one at a time, or maybe two at a time, depending on how tough you feel on the day. So we can now lay everything out. So now if we want to do a pluck, it's going to be pretty easy. Pluck means we pull the heart, lungs, trachea, all out in one go. So then I'm all set up to look at that. So then what we gotta do is we've got to set up our containers to put our stuff in. So we'll have that container here where we'll put all of our, our our 
fresh samples that we're going to we'll fix samples that we're going to put in formalin, and then we'll do individual <coughs> samples for fresh. This guy's a bit autolyzed. I don't know if we're going to get much value out of him, but, okay. but we'll give it a crack. Good. Hey, how you going, Izzy? So, as I drop something in, just with the texture there, just right on the top what they are, and, and then we'll just drop everything into there with some dilute, diluted formalin. Cool beans. So, just start taking some samples. <coughs> So the first thing I'll do is I'll grab a bit of lung. So just looking at these lungs, um, if you found a calf dead in the in the paddock and you want to know did it was it born dead or did it was it born took a breath and then died, you can look at the lungs and these lungs are inflated. If a calf is if you find a calf in the paddock and these lungs are all shriveled up, um, then that would indicate to you that the calf had never taken a breath. So, good, grab a bit of this lung. Here's a bit of fresh lung, bro. And then, that's a big chunk. Formalin penetrates into the tissue. So you don't want to take a great big chunk if you're going to put it in the formalin. Otherwise, it'll chew up all the benefit of the formalin. So just a small piece, centimeter by centimeter. Keep it small. You need 10 times as much formalin as you got product. Okay, so that's the lungs. Um, I'll take a quick gander at the opposite side. So that's called the mediastinum. That separates the two sides of the lungs. Come in here and open it up. That's the vena cava there coming out of the heart. The big vessel that I say when they're bloated up, that gets crushed and then the, the blood can't get to the back end. That's a return side of it, at least the arterial side of the aorta, the same thing happens. And I'll look at the other set of lungs. The other set of lungs look normal. And now I'm going to go look at the heart. So we've got the heart here. This is the pericardium. And there's no, uh, there's nothing in the pericardium. We cut into it when we were opening it. And I'll pull that back one, that heart out so I can have a good look at it. So there's a little heart. This little fella. Oh, I just do them on the ribs. Yeah. Um, chopping boards are nice, but so when I'm chasing something like histophilus or um, which often causes a, a myocardial abscesses and infarcts in the in the myocardium, I'll just take little slices. So in a feedlot steer where I've got like a big brisket, um, sometimes there's fluid in, in, accumulated in the abdomen or in the, in the thorax as well. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe something's making the heart not work, so I'll go through and just look for the abscesses in there. The other thing you can see in these is that you can get a vegetative endocarditis which is Fusobacterium necrophorum, which is stuff that grows between the feet and them. Um, and it comes from like a little bit of acidosis, it goes into the liver, they get abscess in the liver, and then it can settle out in the, in the heart valve. So these are the valves here, these little parachute cord looking jobbies. And you can get these little, little um, in infections here and it makes the heart not work and you get heart failure. That's the part of the lung that pumps blood through the lungs. See how, see how it's, uh, if you look at it, see how that's really thick walled? So it's doing a lot of work and this one's thin walled. It takes a lot more effort to push blood around the body. So that's the, this here is the, the right side of the heart, and that's the left side of the heart, which is a lot thicker. And it's going to have the same sort of valves. See these cool valves, like little parachute cords? It's pretty, pretty amazing, pretty amazing system. So that looks pretty good. We'll uh, let's put a little bit of put a little bit of lung, a little bit of heart tissue into the into fixed, and then we'll put a big chunk in for. Uh, thanks, brother. We'll put another big chunk into uh, into Infrafresh. I don't mind. Just over yonder. All right, now, when I'm doing a postmortem on a feedlot steer as well, I want to see what's going on in that trachea. So we've got infectious bovine rhinotracheitis. He's kind of a nasty little bug. Sounds like a big fancy word. And it is for a, a bovine herpes virus that affects them up in the nose and in the trachea. Hence rhino, which is nose. You don't think rhino's got a big nosy thing. It's called a rhino, rhinoceros, because that big thing growing on his nose. So rhino, tracheitis. It gets a rhinitis inflammation in the nose and a tracheitis inflammation in the trachea. But while I'm here, you can pull that. We can we can then continue and do a pluck if we wanted to, which is where you come in like this and you have to pull both sets of lungs and the heart out. That's called a full pluck. Sometimes we do that. We're not going to do it today. Um, this is the esophagus right here. So the esophagus is soft. So when we when we tube feed a calf, and this is kind of a cool one, when we drop a tube feeder in, we've got a calf that's down and he's got a bit of scourge or whatever, and he's dehydrated. We, we get them up sternally, and in one of my videos, Hydration Nation, you can see where we put the tube down his throat, and if it goes down the trachea, which is there, you pump that fluid into him, it's going to kill him. If you just pour milk into his mouth and try to get him to swallow, often they'll aspirate it, which means take it into the trachea, and it's going to kill him. So with these devices, they've got a ball on the end of that tuber, and when you put it into, the, uh, when you put it into his mouth, 90% of the time, he's going to take it down the esophagus. And that fellow there. So you need to know that it's there. And how do you do that? Well, you feel along his neck and you can feel the end of the ball that's on the end of that, end of that device. Can you see my finger inside there? 
if you can see how you can feel it. If you can feel that tube going down the trip, down the, then you're in the right spot. If it's in here, you can't feel it because it's inside this. So this is kind of like vacuum hose, vacuum tubing. You know, it can't collapse, kind of like on your air sheeter on the suction side. All right, so we want to look inside this esophagus. Um, the reason we like to look in there, there's a couple little worms that can get in there. Esophagotum, something fancy, vet speed, I can't remember. Or you can also see any coastal disease, so if there's a long hair, you can just kind of strip this back. Hey, Swan, yeah, yeah. Swan's Veterinary Services, named after uh, David Swan. Hello, it's my check. So you're looking down the esophagus, looks good. What's going on, bro? Nothing. Oh, cool uh, beans. Get some water. Get right, yeah, so. YouTube. So, so on the esophagus there, you're not seeing much. You're not seeing any ulcers or anything like that. Looks pretty normal. Now with infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, like we were talking about, in a feedlot steer, that often is the precursor to them developing pneumonia, which is three different bacteria predominantly that end up in pneumonia. But that's the viral stuff that gets them, gets them crooked in the first place. So we come in here. So that's called epiglottis. And every time you swallow, that shuts the, the trachea so that you don't aspirate, you don't suck food into your, uh, into your lungs. See that flop, flop, flop. And these are called the arytenoids, these two little guys here. And that's good to look at because you can get that same bug that was in the lungs or in the heart that we were talking about, Fusobacterium necrophorum. He can sit up here between these arytenoids, what they call a kissing lesion, where they're bumping together. They'll get a little ulcer and then they'll get a big bacterial growth right there. And those are honkers or roarers, as we call them in the feedlot. They make a lot of noise and they respond really well to antibiotics. What we want to do here is we want to open this trachea up and see if there's any false sign of IVR, which in this case, there isn't. We don't expect any. This is a little calf that uh, either his mother kicked him out a bit early and he was undercooked. And so we want to try to figure out what's going on with mom. If these continue, we, make, we might give up and see all and take some samples from the mothers, have a look around in the paddock. Or this calf was born on a really hot day and it just couldn't cope. So we're going to talk about timing of calving and things like that. But we do everything we can for these critters. And Owen and his lovely wife, what's your wife's name again, brother? Amy. Amy. They love these cows. And that's why he's brought them down three hour drive. Left home at what, 4.30 in the morning to get here so we can try to figure out what went wrong. There's nothing really there that we want to add to our sample, but just a little bit of information on that. So we're done there. Then we want to come in here and, and see what's going on in the in the uh, abdomen. So we cut through there. Again, on a big steer, we kind of got to break these back. So just for the exercise, I'll kind of show you what I do. Just kind of cut them like, yay. Often when you hit the bottom here, you got to turn your knife and run along like that because the ribs, the cartilage kind of turns and they just break these back. If you're having trouble with them breaking, breaking back, like you're going like this, you can take your knife and just score it along the bottom here. And it, whoops, that helps you break. So there out of the way. All right, so what do we got here? Well, we got the liver here. We got kidneys up in here. We've got a gallbladder right here. We got all this gut. So we've got a, uh, we've got a, an abomasum here. So this, these little guys don't have a rumen. This is an old umbilicus, see, check this out. So the, the, um, the mother used to exchange um, blood and things with the, with the cat, and that's the remnant of that, uh, of that umbilicus. And there's no, um, there's no real rumen yet developed in this guy because he's just a little guy. So this is just going to be his abomasum, which should be full of milk. And I guess it's just kind of gone off from the time it was in there. There's an ulcer there. Lots of ulcers inside that abomasum, inside these folds of it. So that's blood and milk, I would say, is why it's so black. Let's see if we can check that out, bro. Pretty wild, eh? So whether one of the diseases that we talk about is uh, bovine viral diarrhea virus, which is kind of an unfortunate name for a, a disease that causes immune deficiency, but also has these animals that are affected. They get a, if their mother gets exposed to the virus while the calf's in utero, the calf's born persistently infected with BVD, and they, they can have these sorts of what they call mucosal lesions. So they're lesions in the mucosa, from the mouth, the esophagus, they have a mason, the intestine all the way through, and they tend to die pretty early. And it is one of our rule outs in this case. Um, so we'll drop that into the histo. Hopefully it's still salvageable. But yeah, there's a lot of ulceration in that in that abomasum, which is why that all that that milk that's in there is turned that horrible black color, which is digested blood. Sure. Yeah, I don't think I don't think fresh is going to do any good for us on this. It's pretty autolyzed. So autolyzed just means you know broken down, guys. Team necropsy.
Um, okay, so we need some liver. Always get some liver. Take a nice big chunk. Jump up. Yeah, this can go fresh. You know, it's got a little piece for the for the for our histo histo histology. So where they look at it under, <coughs> they um, they fix it in paraffin at the ag department. Amazing people down there that work for us. And then, um, and then I cut it in very thin slices and have a good look at it. So that works pretty good. Then I'll go for the kidney. It's normally I kind of go for that stuff early, but I was a bit excited to get it out of nice and Normally the kidney, you can just pull it out. That kidney looks normal on the outside. Some, the most, the most, usually if there's abnormal pathology in the in the kidney, it's from them being blocked, like a urinary, like urinary calculi, and then the, you get what's called hydronephrosis, so that the, the, the kidneys blow up. <clears throat> With some clostridial diseases, the kidney is one of the first things to fall apart because um, and they call it pulpy kidney, and they'll get rid of self pretty early. But this kidney feels pretty good and looks normal. We'll just chuck a little bit into the histo, and that only gives them. We might as well do fresh on it too. I don't know if they're going to get much value out of these samples going because they're pretty, pretty idolized. So again, just small bits, guys. A little dabble do when it comes to samples for uh, his stuff. Right here, this is the duodenum here. So this, this is the, the adamasum. This is where that the little valve, where the, where the stomach empties into the... Uh, Water. So he was digesting some milk. You can see a little bit going down the, going down the track there. And um, I think if they do get overheated, and it's possible we've got some pretty hot weather, you know, mom can't do everything for him. It's possible that, that all that stress in his room, in his abomasum is from an overheating. So that's, that's just a bit of bad water. So I've been talking to Owen about maybe we're going to push the timing of calving back. So these calves, these, this herd was down in a more southern location, and they just brought them up to your further north farm, where it gets a little bit warmer in the summer. I might push the timing of calving back a little bit. I'll just do a couple more loops about. I don't think there's any reason that this one would be doing. Yeah, just to fix it. I don't think we'll get any value out of that otherwise. And, uh, that's pretty cool too. Here's the, the uh, that's also the uh, circulation, what they turn called the round ligament, which also goes to the umbilicus of the, the calf in utero, gets rid of its urine through the umbilicus, and that just turns into what they call the round ligament. Rad. It's just a really long bladder, um, which gets smaller after the uh, after the, the, the fetal circulation goes away, stays the bladder. And then these round ligaments um, turn into the broad ligament, I think, on the on the, on the uh, females and on the male, just becomes just another bit of, another bit of the architecture that doesn't make sense. <laughs> the colon. Um, so nothing really obvious here. I think it is it is possible that he's just overheated. And that was what Swanee said when I told him we were doing it. He said, I bet you these are gonna be overcooked. So um, we take as good a sample as we can. We'll, we'll grab a bit of brain off of him. And uh, then we'll go from there. So to get to the brain, this little guy is no longer with us. So it's okay to, that's what we want, we want to get. What we want to do is get to where we can cut through this skull in a, in a transverse way. Uh, Ruben does it a different way, which is pretty handy as well. Where he uh, and, and Swanee do it a different way than I do. But the way I was showed the ag department, I'll show you in a second how it works. Multiple ways to skin a cat. Is that skin a cat? So the, this is the, the, the hide will make it really hard to, uh, for the saw to work. You just skin back the area that you want, where you want to get into the, into the brain. You can hold on to that for me, brother, and I'll grab that saw. <coughs> Good. Yeah, I ain't 
set up for much bigger heads than this one. So what we're gonna do guys is, so that the brain extends into here and it goes back here and then there's what they call a tentorial, a tentorium which holds the cerebellum um, in from the cerebrum. When people are injured in car accidents, often what happens is this, the cerebrum or, uh, prolapses through that tentorium or vice versa. And that's how you can look perfectly fine without a pretty severe brain injury. So we're just gonna cut through this, which should allow us Uh, all the uh, all the nerves that come out of the base of the skull that are holding it in as well as the hypothalamus so that's pretty good we're going to fix this but I'm going to cut off just a little section of it uh, for uh, for fresh so we don't need that much for fresh and then the rest of it I can put into the fix Yeah, here's a bit of fresh brella into one of those yellow ones. Pop it in there, and then we'll get the rest of the brain now. Uh, we'll get it coming to the back part of the brain here. Yeah, that's the rest of the cerebellum, and that is called the tentorium right there. So you can cut it. Flipping back, reflecting back. Coming on this side. Just kind of reflect it forward. Right there. You can see what I mean by if the brain herniates through that, it just really tears stuff up. So I like to decelerate really quickly. I didn't leave enough there to hold those on, so do that hypothalamus. And now this thing should be able to push that cerebellum out of there. Fixed. Yeah, it'll be fixed. So that's the that's the brainstem, and so um, when when the brain's severely damaged, this part still runs your heart and lungs. Um, the cerebellum here is kind of, you know, when you don't have to think about what you're doing, you can chew gum and walk at the same time. This is how you, you learn repetitive things, like how to swing a tennis racket and things like that. So you learn, uh, you know, what they call muscle memory. And so doing repetitive things, you don't have to think about it anymore, which is why it's so important to do it right the first time when you're learning, because once you train this thing, it's pretty hard to untrain. This is all the thinking side of business. And uh, yeah, that's him. With BVD, oftentimes this is small, cerebellar um, uh, hyp 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 uh, atrophy, um, or you can get um, hydranencephaly, where you've got like a, a very enlarged ventricles inside the brain. This all looks pretty normal, but I think Swanee might be on the money. It could just be um, just a, a calf that just got too bloody hot. Maybe it was born a little bit early because it got hot and mum got stressed. So the way calving starts in, in, in uh, British cows is the cow decides at some stage, rightio, time to get this baby gone. So the, the CO goes away, so the, the progesterone is produced by the CL is gone, and then it waits for the calf to send a stress signal. So once the calf gets stressed, it reduces cortisol, and that initiates partition. But if the cow gets stressed, she produces her own cortisol, it can still do the same thing um, in late pregnancy. Same with the calf. So. Anyhow, we can only but try. So we've, we've got some samples. We'll send them off. Hopefully, we'll get an answer for Owen. But I think moving your calving back is probably going to be a good thing. Thanks a lot, Rubes. That was rad. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers, bye.